And we are live. I am joined by Scott O'Gallagher. Man, I was like a kid in a candy shop off air right there. So kind of pick up to where we left off. First of all, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, brother. Good to see you. Good to see you. We, um, for those first time listening, I met you through Ryan Hollins on those Instagram lives. I'm like, man, these are just such great conversations. I have to get you on the podcast. But I wanted to pick your brain because I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a hardcore gamer, but the one game, like the games that I truly play more than anything are sports games. So um, being incorporated in that world, how much of an impact has that had on just the basketball community as a whole? Because I remember when it first started, obviously people gravitated towards it, but now it just seems like players care about their ratings. Like people are tuned into everything with these games now. Yeah, I've seen a substantial change in the 10 years I've been doing it. Um, just from, as you just figure the, the, te- the technological savvy with these players now is better than when I first got in, right? I mean, I, I would even say the late, great Kobe, somebody who I met uh, here in Orlando back in 2012. I mean, he was just kind of like thinking about it, right? He had been on the covers of games before, but it was more or less like, wow, there's there's more here. And then again, as these as the audience goes and it gets younger, um, and as it comes up and these you know games get bigger and bigger, it's only growing. It's only becoming more of a thing. So um, they have a much better understanding of what it is um, and its culture right now with a lot of it, right? So it's just everybody's talking about it. Even just it's, now it's more than their rating. It's, it's shots. It's everything else. I mean, uh, badges, abilities, all types of stuff that are going on right now. So it's, it's, it's really deep. Now, from someone who's been in the industry for a while, such as yourself, um, and you're obviously still a fan of just playing the game as a consumer, but yet you're behind the scenes as well. What is the next phase? What is the next step? Like for someone way back in the day, you may not have thought it would get this far, but now clearly it's gained momentum to the point where people are making livings off this. Um, People make millions of dollars through tournaments. How far do you think the gaming industry can go? Oh, I think it's just getting started, um, to be honest with you. I think there's still a lot out there, both from the development side on these games and how much further that they can grow um, to the opportunities um, that they're going to land for other people that are out there. There's no doubt. Um, Working on basketball games, you know, I always say now that, you know, we're the 31st, you know, NBA team, right? Like, that's how close you are. Like, I've had multiple conversations. I had two opportunities with um, NBA teams in the past four years to potentially join and have an opportunity there. Um, I would say it's oh, it definitely opened up something else um, as far as that goes. But I mean, why why does I say that? I don't say that as a pat myself on the back. I mean, there's a test, there's a knowledge, there's certain people that you meet with. But I mean, I've had some outstanding conversations with Frank Vogels, the Doc Rivers, the Kevin McHale's. Wow. And the list goes on and on and on. And you're talking like deep down X's and O's. And until once they really get to know you, then those conversations, Max, go a lot further. It's like, oh, okay, you're not just a guy behind the keyboard. So that was where I felt like I kind of molded that gap in there. So um, I just had a conversation with a representative from Portland and a representative from um, somebody on the, um, um, their um, group over in Denver, which I'm trying to say without like actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> names um can't be dropping tapes out here uh, Max, but um but just hey you did this to dame why right like i you heard you probably saw on twitter i know we were talking about it but like not fouling multiple times when you're up three and you got arguably one of the best guard shot makers in the league you know i thought it was coaching malpractice you know that was kind of the verb that was just me being a passionate guy just as yourself so it's opened up a ton of opportunities. I have these conversations pretty much every day or every other day. And then it went down to even, uh, I can say it now, he's retired, like Long Kruger staff in Oklahoma. And like, so like, oh, you really like Trey Young. I mean, it wasn't just that. It was more or less like what they ran, how they ran it. It was pretty right. easy to say, well, Trey Young is going to be somebody special. That's incredible. Yeah, that's incredible. Now, um, before we get in the NBA topic, it's just very rare that you have an opportunity to speak to someone such as yourself about the gaming world. So I want to just get this in-depth kind of perspective for my audience is, have you ever seen the movie Ready Player One? You know what? 
I, I think I've breezed through some of that. It's an incredible movie, and probably should have seen it, but I want to say I ran into it somewhere. But yes. I'm the worst movie watcher you've ever known. Really? No doubt. Oh, I'm, I'm a movie. I'm a sports nerd, like to, to the, <laughs> as we all. But I mean, I like watch over a hundred Dodger games, probably over 70, 75 Laker games. Haven't missed a Rams game in twenty eight years. Wow. Like I don't, I haven't seen Indiana Jones. Haven't watched any of the Star Wars. Like I'm the worst you've ever seen. So when Man. it comes to that, if it's not Will Ferrell, it's really tough to keep your boy. In the right. <laughs> well, what I was saying is, so in Ready Player One, they basically immerse themselves into the gaming world, like where it's no longer you're playing in front of a screen. It's like it's almost valued more your game self than your actual self in real life, because it's almost like people can escape from their real world problems. It takes place in the future and they can go into this gaming verse and be whatever they want to be. So. My question for you would be, as far as the development of the actual games itself, how much better can these games become? Because clearly we've seen the evolution of gaming. Like, is there like an end goal? Is it the graphics? Is it just the realistic play? Like, how good can these games possibly get? Like, some people wonder, how much better can the iPhone get? Like, is it a hologram? Like, how much better can the games get? Oh, man. I mean, look what, um, look what TVs have done. Right. You went from the big tube TVs and, you know, you're younger. I know you. you yeah, yeah, yeah. Big tubes and they go to L the plasmas and the LCDs and the LEDs. And now, you know, you look at like an OLED, it's smaller than our iPhones. Right. I think not only the physical hardware that we have to the software, everything is getting crazy. I, I, again, I, I still just think we're just touching the surface. I mean, if you look at like what some of my favorite videos out there are like, look at LeBron James and video games here yeah. and then look at the end of his career. Like those are awesome. Um, but from an authenticity standpoint, I still think there's a long way to go. Um, uh, graphically. I mean, there's crazy leaps that the industry is making. That's, that's um, definitely apparent. Um, you've seen the jumps from like a, a PlayStation three to a PlayStation four. That was enormous. So, now these games got instant load times where you just hit a button and you load right into your, you know, your favorite team's arena. So, again, I think we're just touching the surface. I think authenticity-wise, they say not just player likeness, but X's and O's, everything else, the depth and, and the stuff that's really out there to be done. A I'm lot still of players are using it for scouting tools now, so um, that's you'll see it in a in a way. Right. I'm still trying to get my hands on a PS5. I, I'm still trying to do that one. It's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's brutal. Um, I would also tell you, too, I had uh, multiple, I had two G, I'd say multiple GMs kind of asked about the same thing. But when it comes to like simulation and what these different look, I mean, we're in the analytical world, right? We look right. At, here we are with Philly again and Daryl Morey. It's a different style of what he has, but. Um, that's where we're at. Hey, if I put this lineup together, what does this get me? Uh, what does this get me under your phone uh, instead right. of straight? Here's an Excel sheet and and just go like, no, these are, you know, all the ratings of all the players and and let me throw this in a pot. Let's see what I get. That's a fantastic point. If it gets the game gets so realistic to the point where you can test lineups without actually having to cost the game and doing it and finding out the hard way. Like Vogel put out a lineup that never happened before and never played a game against Phoenix. And it was like, they've never played a game together, and it did not work whatsoever. So if he had the opportunity. Yeah, wow. Yeah, like Wes Matthews, right? That guy got out, what, he get 23, 25 minutes in that closeout game? Like, I don't remember him playing that much at all all year. So, no. yeah, there, there's there's a lot of the old heads are starting to come around. Um, yeah. Because they know that if they don't, they're going to get passed by. Like, that's where we're at. you got to kind of have a no. Do I think you have to go as – as crazy as just key or three from a you know basketball standpoint, no. Um, but there's certain things that you got to do. I mean, the mid-range game is eventually going to come back. I think the numbers are going to start to show it. I agree. I agree. And I think it always shows when you get deep into the postseason and it's more physical and you just have to get a bucket. We've seen Jimmy Butler thrive. Um, you've seen like Kawhi's thrive and whatnot. Kevin Durant's pull-up mid-range is still elite. Dirk's one leg. But let's get into the basketball world. So I want to start off with this. So I'm a Trey Young guy. I want to get your opinion on this. I've got an opportunity to interview him his rookie year, seen his development. Um, Trey Young has been a top five point guard in the league, in my opinion. He's been a top, he's been a superstar 
in the league, but he needed the platform to do it. He needed the MSG. He needed the garden because the Hawks weren't getting a bunch of televised games for the public that just the average consumer, but they were watching the postseason. Um, but I think we live in this microwave society where we want those young stars to just win right away. So people are impatient. But if you look at what he's done, he's put up historical numbers from the start. And now he's in the second round against the number one seed and he's up a game. What do you make of Trey Young and what he's been able to accomplish this season? Trey Young was not a pat on my back. I called it. But you look at what Lon was running for him or they were running at Oklahoma. Led the point, led the country in points and assists, right? His dad, the pedigree of his dad playing too. Like, so, that, I mean, there is a knowledge base there. Um, his ability to control tempo, I mean, is, it has improved. I always had it between, I mean, really him and Ja Morant. I used to kind of say something similar when Ja was just going crazy. He was like, can you really name me five better point guards than him? And Trey's right, you know, was there. But Trey's, what he's doing right now as far as, shooting and extending the floor is just second second to none. I think, too, Nate McMillan deserves a ton of credit. That dude's maturation deserves a ton of credit because I he doesn't get enough love for how he's adapted his game, um, in my opinion, because, I mean, even his rookie year, he was bombing away. Like, hey, I'm going to take two steps. No one's touched it. Now he's kind of figured out right. you know, how to get himself going. And I think just the way we have to look, too, at the game is different. Um, I think it's Rashad Phillips that has the archetype system that he's built. I love it. Like that's to me, that's where the game has got to go. That's people got to start seeing positions like that. Um, you know, cause there's the whole positionless basketball and all that stuff. That's that we're talking. Thing. That's, yeah. I really love all of that stuff. And if people kind of started to see things, cause if you were a Hooper, like when I was overseas, not too long ago, like, you knew these. This is the kind of skill set that people had. He's like, ah, he's not really a stretch four. He's kind of a playmaking four. He's kind of so. That's how we we need to get out of that traditional sense on how we're viewing players. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, video games. I would say have tried it and have mentioned it. You know, like in these positions, hey, this guy is a stretch X or this guy is a playmaking whatever. But um, yeah, that's that's kind of my view. And Trey kind of falls into that thing scoring point guard but he can play off the basketball he doesn't have to be your old like rod strickland floor, floor general he's a hybrid right. so many things that's why i actually i said ea sports or 2k needs to take his um his player descriptions and position manual because it's like i've seen it as far as oh it's like a stretch big or a play making a point forward um a two-way and i'm like you, you, specifically if you can use this manual i'm like i think that would fit the players perfectly because how can you evaluate a Draymond Green and say him and Marcus Aldridge play the same position. They're not the, even though they're listed as power forwards, they're both not the same position. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's it's really ridiculous at this point, right? It's yeah, it's it's that, and I, I love too how you can apply it to the older players as well. You right. Know, I had this when everybody was, hey, Lamarcus Aldridge is no doubt a Hall of Famer. Like I love Lamarcus. I've played with him. Um, is he really better than Rasheed Wallace? I don't think so. So, mm -hmm. but I, Rasheed Wallace was his game was ten, fifteen years ahead of its time. He was stretching the, whether he came in and that for Arvidas and had to switch and play the five, or just be that stretch four. That dude was he was way ahead of his time. Yeah, different. Um, as far as the series as a whole, I think oh. I really think Atlanta has a great opportunity to beat Philly. Um, Embiid came back in game one. We didn't know if he was going to play game one. He plays game one. And then Atlanta went big in that first game. I don't know if they're going to do the same thing back to back, but what are you, how are you evaluating that series? Do you have Philly coming out? Do you think Atlanta has a good opportunity as well? I had Philly coming out to begin with. I didn't realize that Trey would have that type of dominance um, just because I thought that they could throw different bodies at him, but no one's, no one's touching him. Um, they literally threw five different pick and roll schemes at him in game one, and none of them mattered. He, he literally was controlling him. And he was beating him too because you can't let Trey have 35 and have 10 dimes. It doesn't work. And he could have more than that, you know. So um, Atlanta shoots it well. They can spread you out. So I think off ball is probably in game two where they make their biggest adjustment because, I mean, Philly's backs against the wall. Got to win. But Danny Green has no chance in staying with him. So I think they're going to have to change that up, which then limits potentially Philly spacing on the offensive end. So uh, Doc's got his work cut out for him, and, and Embiid balled out. 
and they still lost. So, yeah, that's what's scary. Yeah, it is. It's it's getting really really scary. I mean, Nash better passer, but I mean, look at what Nash was doing in that four round one five out offense, and now Trey's extending you by, you know, another fifteen feet from shooting. Yeah. It. So it's like. This dude is an absolute problem. I love it for kids. Sorry in this ramble, but the reason I love him, obviously smaller, understands how to how to create contact, understands how to control his body, control tempo, and yet he's just changing speeds. He's not the quickest. He's not the fastest. But a shot is efficient. You got to play him and understands everything that there is on the game. Again, five, four, five different pick and roll coverages killed them all. Yeah, he's truly a chess player. And what I really like about him is he has that dog. Like, he has that, I'm not going to back down. I want to get better. I want to go at you. It's like, if he scores on you, he wants to embarrass you and score on you again. He's not very um, passive aggressive. He's confrontational. And I think that's such an underrated quality because we all look at the stat sheet, but I think the intangibles is what makes the greats. I mean, you look at Steph Curry, you look at Damian Lillard, and I think he possesses that quality. I agree. I, I, completely, I love the bow in New York. Like, that was that's his moment. That's I mean, his that's, moment, Scott. You, you got to do it. Like I, I, I love, I love all the showmanship. You don't like it, then stop it. Right. So, I, absolutely. I, I loved it. Um, let's stay in the East. Your thoughts on the Brooklyn Nets? I've said James Harden is the most valuable Brooklyn Net, um, but I think Kevin Durant's the best player on that team. I've said it's in a weird way. What brought this team together was all three of them went under uh, criticism at one point in time in their career. Kevin Durant, obviously, the move to Golden State. Um, it's seen as a weak move. It was Steph's team. Kyrie Irving's hard to play with. The flat earth theory. You had Cleveland. You had Boston. Then you had James Harden's hard to play with. Look, he couldn't get along with Chris Paul. He couldn't get along with Dwight Howard. He couldn't get along with Russell Westbrook. So in a weird way, when they all go to Brooklyn, it's like, okay, let's all three buy in. And point. And James Harden's like, I'm going to pass it to you guys. Kyrie Irving's like, okay, I'll play off the ball and be more efficient than I've ever been. 50, yeah. 40, 90. Kevin Durant's like, I'm going to be unselfish. Let's go to a team that's never won before and create this culture in a weird way. I felt like that's united them more than anything. And so now when James Harden does leave, it doesn't change. They don't skip a beat. No. That's my takeaway from Brooklyn. What would be yours? I said it from the get go. I mean, I think you, you were probably on that same show when uh, I came out to Brendan and Ryan and said, I don't think anybody's beaten. I don't think anybody's beaten Brooklyn four times in two weeks. I don't see it because then you put in Joe Harris is having big games. He, the way he can stretch you. Um, you know, Blake Griffin, you knew the resurgence was coming. I mean, Detroit with the Pistons right now is a lot like the Cleveland Browns was and Detroit Lions for football for a lot of, lot of ways, right? Just, you know, guys get this. They don't want to go in that market. doesn't play well. I mean, there's been some ups and downs over there, obviously. Um, so, again, I, I, I thought they would beat Milwaukee. I'm not really buying too much into them, believe it or not, as hot as they were coming in. Will they shoot, what, eight for 20-something from three again? Probably not. Um, Drew Holiday guards Kyrie as good as anybody in the league. Um, Harden down, will it hurt? Sure, but I mean, people forget how efficient KD is too. So I mean, that's a, they got. They literally have three players that demand double teams. That's insane. So it's not. I don't see anybody with the offensive firepower um, that's going right. to happen defensively too. I think they can play better D um, than maybe what people are thinking. Yeah. And it's, I said, the only team, my prediction was the Lakers to repeat. And I thought they could against Brooklyn just because defensively the versatility and their lineups, and then you still have that firepower in LeBron and then AD, obviously they're not healthy. They get bounced. I just don't see anyone touching Brooklyn now. No one out of the West. Cause we don't even know who's coming out of the West per se. And the East, I think your best shot would be Milwaukee and they beat them when James Harden left the game. So I just feel like Every championship has a little bit of luck. I mean, you look at the Golden State Warriors when Drew Holiday got injured, Mike Conley got injured, Kyrie Irving got injured. It's not a discredit to them, but sometimes things just fall into place your way. And I just feel like everything is falling in place for Brooklyn to just play ball and win a championship. Absolutely. It's happening with them all. Was Jordan still going to beat the Lakers in 91? Sure. But Byron Scott and Worthy getting hurt. I mean, didn't, didn't right. cause uh, much. Um Lakers in 89 with magic hamstring injury that that puts him out of that. I mean, basically out of final. Was he going to stop necessarily Isaiah from getting his because they probably should have or could have won in 88? Probably not. But, you know, you do. You need some of that. Um, Lakers got lucky in 88 when Isaiah Thomas has this was the bum ankle. So, yeah, you're absolutely right there. Um, but I don't see. I don't know. Just. LeBron's the the one exception, because LeBron, the reason I thought the same thing was like, 
he he controls the pace of that game. Yep. Unless you're Golden State and that ball is moving, boom, 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 and they're just shooting you the hell out the building, LeBron's going to control it. And so that's always like, oh, that's I still would would take the Lakers. Giannis can't do that. Again, playoff time. He's not a great passer. Can't post up. And if he does, it's it's deep post catches. He's not going to shoot it outside of the restricted circle. So he's he's easier to guard. Right. He doesn't cause those same problems that uh, the other superstars do. He just right. doesn't, especially in a seven game series. Absolutely. And and it just always your strengths. I feel like. Um, only magnify in the postseason, but so do your weaknesses because everything's under a telescope and teams are playing hard every single game. I want to transition to the West and specifically the Dallas Mavericks. And I've said Mark Cuban has the ticket to the NBA future. He has the keys to the NBA future where you have your number one option, your superstar gets you to the elevator, but who your number two is determines on how far you go up. And you look at all the great teams, the number two, Dwayne Wade to LeBron. You look at the Scotty Pippen to Jordan. You need that number one. You have a really rare opportunity to have such a young special talent in Luka. But who you get as your number two will determine how high this this elevator goes up. What does Mark Cuban have to do to get a number two? Who Who can it be? What does he have to do? Because I think as a smart guy that he is, he understands that as well. Yeah, well, I think they, they had a big swing and miss when it came to Porzingis. I think everybody's starting to see that, right? Just from his inability to want to post up. I mean, I think the attitude is kind of all over the place as now you're reading right. you know, some of the frustrations of that Luca is handling it as much as he is. And Luca's usage rate is, is high, but I mean, he's producing like at an insane rate, right? That's the face of the league is, uh, is Luca for sure. So wh- who do they go and get? I'd have to go back and scan. I usually do it like right, usually during the finals. It's like you take a little free agent eval, check it out. Ah, who's out there? Where could they go? Because right. you're still in testing the waters right now, like even with the Lakers, right? They're, they could have like seven new guys show up again, right? I know we're staying on Dallas here, but um, what's Andre Drummond going to do? Is he a number two for Dallas? No, absolutely not. So I'm not saying him, but they do need a bona fide tier two guy. And I think they need a legit tier two guy tier one tier two guy and it's not like like chris middleton to me is not that dude is going to have to play like out of the chris middleton body for them to to go on so people are you know seeing the struggles that he's had it's like that that doesn't so in the in this series in game one doesn't surprise me at all right who they get it's like a dame like he really does need a damian lillard for sure you know like Dame wants a better environment. Dame wants this opportunity to play and have help. Luca needs the same exact thing. Now, Dame's a very loyal guy. I'm not saying it happens, but that I feel like that's the type of guy he needs. A scorer, spread the floor as well. Obviously, has his mind focused on basketball, takes care of his body, is available all the time. I feel like that would be a match made in heaven. For sure. Um, yeah, that, that, that would work. Could Luca play off the ball? As much probably, I would, I would, I would hope so. He handles it a lot, but that would be nice for, for him to do it. Is there like an AD type guy? Probably not. Um, I don't know. That's a great one with Dallas in particular. Portland is, is a is another tough one for the fact of. Neil O'Shea, I feel, is the one that you got to come after, here. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily Terry Stotts. I get they've had problems, but do what? When was the last time Dallas won a playoff series? With Rick Carlisle, who's one of the better offenses and defense or offensive minds in the game, um, they said, "Oh, we, you know, we picked up what is it, you know, Derek Jones, or we, you know, we got uh, uh, Covington. Like those guys ain't moving the needle, not for what Dame is trying to do. You're not getting out of the West with those, and you're hyping up those two moves. Like with all due respect to those dudes, we're one of the best 455 players, you know that you know they're in the world. But come on, man, like that's not that's not gonna no. happen." And CJ's rumored in freaking trading rumors every single day. You'll find every, a CJ McCollum trade rumor. Yeah, every year. And it, the coach is always the first to go. It's what happens. The Clippers, Doc goes. Um, now, obviously, Stotts goes. Now they're talking about Rick Carlisle may go. It, it, it's a bunch of different. I think the coach is always the face of it to go. Brad Stevens, obviously, that situation in Boston, he goes. His Granted, it's a little different because now he's the head of basketball operations. But typically, yeah. when there's just stagnant, 
type of feel in a in an organization the coach is typically the first to go For but sure. and carlisle has like is creative i'd say the same thing with stots as far as the stuff in which they run from nexus and o's perspective um we've seen the success dames had do, do these guys just forget how to coach you know that that's always kind of been my my problem with it. I mean, are we, it's not like we're still trying to run the triangle, right? You know, here and we won't get out of it. You know, I don't. So I feel like coaching has become just dealing with personalities, which and, like, in Portland, okay. I don't think was the case either, right? So right, you're right. I agree with you. Yeah, um, you're a, you you've been had such incredible insight every time I hear you talk about the Lakers. So I know they're obviously not in it, and we'll. Before I let you go, we'll obviously talk about Phoenix and Denver and who you have winning that series as well. Clippers, Utah, it's a really interesting series. Um, But as far as the Lakers, I know everyone, as far as LeBron James, whenever he wins or whenever he loses, it's LeBron James. It's going to be talked about. People are going to hate it when he loses. People will love it when he wins. That's just LeBron. It's been the story of his whole career. Um, But what I've said is I always like to take a step back and not be a prisoner of the moment for good or for worse. And I said, okay, is he aging? Absolutely. But he's also coming off an ankle injury, which people I think completely forgot about. And I think what he does is he gets rested. I think AD gets rested. I think he probably has a heart because he's a master communicator. I think he has a heart to heart conversation with AD and talks about preparation for a season. AD who's clearly already pissed off because he played even when he shouldn't have, he's heard the criticism about street clothes Davis. I think they come back rested and motivated. The question is what they do with this roster. What has been your whole takeaway with the Lakers? Are you, on the side of, oh, it's kind of over, LeBron's old, or are you kind of siding with my take on that? No, I think LeBron at minimum gets to five championships. I just, for yeah, some I agree. Reason, five, five is always, he's one away. That one is always just, I don't know. It just, it feels right. Like it just, it's there, whether he's with the Lakers or somebody else, which I don't think he's going to leave anywhere else. But um, I think this dates back to the moves that happened in free agency. Um, JaVale McGee was one hell of a rim protector. Dwight Howard was one hell of a pick and roll defender, and you saw how they used each one in the in the bubble, right? I mean, McGee they couldn't play him in in particular series, but you and they, but you can play Dwight in Houston, but then Dwight was huge against Denver, right? So those two meshed. You missed out on playoff Rondo. Rondo was exceptional in that series, like another coach on the floor, and instead now you're getting like Caruso's playing more minutes. You've got Schroeder in there. That was I was kind of up and down on yeah. throughout the year. But then you got Gasol, defensive player of the year, but yet you always attacked him in pick and rolls. You always have, you always will. Same thing with like Gobert, especially as he gets older. Um, we're looking too much at just these rim protection numbers on seven footers that are just dropping underneath the basket, um, in my opinion. But where where do they go? Um that's going to be a big one for the fact of Wes Matthews. That, that, that was an awful experiment that did not work out for them. Is Schroeder a 20 plus million dollar a year player? Absolutely not. I mean, that guy lost a lot of money. Okay. You look at that. Kuzma is who I told Laker fans he was three, four years ago. Like, he's no different to me than Jordan Clarkson. And all that when Jordan Clarkson played under Byron Scott and was putting up just huge, I mean, bigger numbers for a rookie on just a bad team. And right. Clarkson, shout out to him killing it, you know, six man of the year. But that was the same thing. But you're in Laker and market matters, obviously, right? Like, yeah. So again, I, Max, I couldn't tell you how many people were blowing up my Twitter when I was like, Kuzma can go, Kuzma can go in the <laughs> AD deal because they were like, you know, you read, a lot of these people wanted to keep Kuzma over Brandon Ingram. I never saw it. It was just like the skill set is not even close, guys. So it looks good now. Um, I'm That's the best it. feeling, isn't it? Isn't that the best feeling when you know you called something, people call you crazy, and then a couple of years later it comes to comes out like you were right about it? Oh, man. <laughs> it's, it's great. I actually I had the um, – where is that? I had I book a, over my book. But there's – Let's see, you got that. Uh, Car- Caruso's making just over two and a half million, right? So he's an unrestricted free agent. So I think he's gone. He's going to get paid somewhere to where LA can't, you know, can't take care of him. Montrez Harrell, another one that never worked. Yeah, and I, love, so cool. I like the attitude. I love is it. that coaching? Is that is that coaching though? Because is Vogel really all of a sudden just stopped playing him? 
Yeah. See, this one to me is not coaching, which is contrary to a lot of beliefs because Doc didn't play him either against Denver. That's true. Right? You couldn't play him. He doesn't guard. He's undersized. He can't space the floor. He needs to put the ball on the on the deck to do something. So the way you're playing him is is has got to be is in spurts. I think, you know, I think LeBron would have been a bigger advocate for him, you know, had he been able to produce. Right. So you got questions at the center position, obviously, because Drummond I thought was going to be the hybrid between a Dwight and Javel, and yet he was neither. He was not a rim protector and was not good in the pick and roll. So. I mean, he got paid, what was his buyout, 26, 27 million? I mean, so I mean, he's, he's, he got paid. Um, Lakers got a lot of questions to get answered. They need a lot more shooting. Uh, KCP's deals, what, two more years left on that? So they're not going to get out of that one either. Um, so they got more questions than answers right now. Right. Luckily, there's a couple good free agents on the market. Um, obviously the culture changed. Not, it wasn't too long ago, a couple years back. I mean, the culture was terrible in LA with the whole magic Johnson and Rob Palenka. So at least they have that underway. Yep. You have LeBron, you have a championship under your belt, you have AD. So I don't think it should be as hard to be able to acquire a new roster as it was once in the past. Uh, you're hundred percent right. And I totally believe in Rob anyways, for the fact that he yeah. retooled a roster, just won a championship. And yeah, he thought, thought that he got better. Yeah, he does not get enough credit for that because as soon they were, I remember everyone was talking about just the dumpster fire that LA was, and yet a year later, as soon as it's under his reign and he can just fully focus on what his decisions were, they win a championship, yeah. bubble or no bubble. That's impressive. Mm-hmm. I mean, they could even get visits from free agents. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's how in- people forget that's how bad it was. I mean, you had, I mean, a lot of guys, you know, Lamarcus Aldridge turned him down. I, don't, I, I can't remember somebody. Was it Mello? Somebody didn't even come. Like oh, I was, think it was Carmelo. So, I mean, there was guys that were, you know, taking arguably the most prestigious organization in all of the NBA and just not even coming. So, right. I mean, Boston's going to have that same problem. Right? Like, what free agent is going to Boston right now? I've heard there's rumors Jason Tatum may not want to be there. I don't know how factual that is or not because that's his organization. He's the man. But as a young – I feel like – as just a society, we get smarter over time. Technology gets better over time. Athletes get better over time. I feel like Jason Tatum probably, because he's obviously been a fan of his whole life, probably sees the writing on the wall. Okay, I'm young. I'm putting up the stats, but I'm starting to see already people don't want to come here. So I feel like a guy like him or a guy like Zion, wouldn't you want to do things differently and get out quicker? I don't know if that's just me, but I just feel like why waste that time when everyone – we always talk about what if LeBron wasn't in Cleveland for as long as he was. And he had help. So I, what if there's a Jason Tatum who's starting to think that in the back of his mind? Like, okay, I've seen older stars talk about how they needed help. And if he can't get it, how long can you persuade him? Is it just for the money do you think he stays? Probably. The max deal. Um, yeah. You know, Boston, Boston loves him. Um, and obviously that's a phenomenal sports town in general. But um, I just, They're in a situation, though. For sure. There is. Um, but, I mean, once... Again, everything changes once people start getting paid. Once Jalen Brown got his money, you know, now Tatum's getting his money, then things just start to trickle down. I think the, the Tristan Thompson signing was just an absolute, I think, I don't know who wouldn't see that one coming. So, <laughs> uh, with respect to him, I mean, again, in respect to guys in the NBA, of course, right? It's like, it's, it's crazy because it's like we can't, you can't criticize anybody anymore. No, but I know exactly where you're coming from. All these guys. Within the NBA, you know, leveling, right? Like you're just sitting there like, no, I mean, within this, of course, he's better than every Joe Blow that's out here. Yeah, you're just, you, you, every once in a while, you get someone that just wants to take that bite and just blow it out of proportion and act like he's trash. We're not saying that. He, like you said, just compared to NBA standards. Um, Yeah, I mean, look at, and too, market wise, again, market does matter. Who's going to Portland? What free name the last big free agent they signed. They can't get. That's why. That's why everyone's like, "Dame, you got to go." Like it, it's time. You you put in the work. We we value loyalty into the point where you just can't win. And now we're like, okay, we understand if you leave. It's it's like if you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you're an NBA player, if a player wants to leave, we talk about oh, players are moving everywhere. But when they stay and they can't win because they can't get help, so we're like, oh, he's not a winner. He's not winning. It's like so. I, if an NBA player, I think you should do what's best for you and your career. He, if that's what he wants, I respect it. But I feel like he's such an all-time talent 
But unless he gets in a situation where he can have an opportunity to compete for a championship, we will look back at it and possibly not value it as much as we should have. No, we won't. We absolutely won't. I mean, I'll say it right now. I mean, there's people that when it when both careers are over, not a chance in hell I would take Russell Westbrook's career over Dame's. No. No way. No way. But, well, but the Center history home. the yeah. history look at Westbrook, like he'll, they'll have higher regards for him than Damian Lillard because of the triple double. The triple double. Um, again, I don't know if you've heard me say that before. The triple double was crazy. Not that I don't respect the triple double, of course. It's overrated. Like, once you got him, once he got it, I said he's going to do it next year too. Right? Look at more threes, fast play, longer rebounds. And he's already a monster. That you're not I'm not discrediting that, but I'm saying if that right. was your criteria on why you gave it to him, then you better give it to him the next year and every year after. You're sounding just like narrative. it's like Dame is out here holding the, a, a franchise on his back. And yet this dude is like maybe like third or fourth place, maybe in MVP voting. I and said so what, I, what I worried about is that eventually the reason why I love what Bill Simmons and the ringer do is because they portray the, they always are trying to get it out right, whether it's, you know, Bob Cousy, Dr. J of like, hey, this is really the story here um, that happened. And I worry that as time goes on, especially for somebody like Dame, who tried to do the right thing. Is that a different narrative starts to swing? And it's like, well, he could have went. He didn't go. So this one is on him. And then he went and, you know, they had these many first round exits and he was just stuck with, you know, right. an average crew comparative. That's not young mellow. That's a spot catch and shoot mellow at this point, you know. So yeah. I mean, don't say he played with Carmelo Anthony, man. He played with the shell of Carmelo Anthony. Exactly, but and people looking back at it won't view it as that, unfortunately. So that's why for for his legacy, I hope he does. But obviously, he's he's a grown individual. He can whatever he decides to do. I respect it. Um, before I let you go, Scott, um, your thoughts on Phoenix very quickly. Phoenix and Utah. I think it's a very interesting series, but in a weird way. The good Clippers team is just a weird team, but I still think they have a really good opportunity to make it out the West. How do you how do you see that series uh, coming out to fruition? Clippers proved me wrong. God looked like an ass when they were down 0-2 and they lost both at home, dude. I was like, yo, they're done. They were done. I was clowning Clipper Daryl on IG and everything, man. I was just. Mm-hmm. I think everybody was though. I think everybody was. We didn't expect the road team to go six and zero until Game Seven. So bad, man. So bad. I mean, how does Dallas allow it to happen? It's just too, it's the Clippers. It's like, man, there's not even Clipper fans in LA, man. They don't even exist. It's strange. The whole series. Laker fans. Yeah, the whole series was just strange. It is. I think I still have Utah coming out of the West. I think. Really? Utah, yeah. I think Utah's the best team. Um, so, uh, unless it was the Lakers, who I didn't really feel obviously were a true seven seed. Uh, Phoenix is, is, was impressive. I mean, I think even a healthy AD, I don't think the Lakers won in that series compared to what people think. Dude, they got their ass kicked. I mean, game one was – game one AD didn't look great. It's another reason why you don't play with your food. You know, you didn't come out and just hit him right in the mouth in game one. You end up winning game two. But then, you know, Devin Booker was eventually going to take that leap. And so and, – and he did. Um, I have Utah coming out. I think Phoenix is going to be a tough out. I don't know. It's the Clippers. I'm seeing a lot of people right now after they won say, "Hey, this looks like a championship team." And blah blah oh. blah. Like, I'm not. I'm not going to sign up for that. So, no. um, I still have Utah coming out. It'll be. I think they got too many weapons as far as like the way that they enough shooting. Got enough. They play good enough defense. Quinn Snyder's an outstanding coach. So, who do you like? Do you have Phoenix? Uh. I don't. It, it's hard. I, I just didn't see it ever all playing out like this at all. So now, given the new information, um, I, I would say Phoenix uh, gets over the hump with Denver. Um, I think I could see Utah beating the Clippers. That's the one I'm just on the fence with. I, I, my gut is telling me the Clippers win it, but my eyes are telling me Utah is clearly the better basketball team as far as just continuity and just everyone knowing their roles, you know what you're getting night in and night out. The Clippers, one night I'm getting Kawhi scoring 45 points, he can't miss, and then the other night, they're the worst fourth quarter team in the league. So it's kind of hard to put your eggs in one basket with them. Um, But as far as who comes out of the West, either way, I have them losing to Brooklyn. I would want for it to be Phoenix. That's who I would root for out the West. I think Chris Paul, 
um, has been underappreciated for most of his career. Um, I think fi- he was my MVP this season. I think a lot of people are starting to see the CP3 effect as far as wherever he goes, he's able to elevate others. Um, so I think it'd be good for him, his career to go to the finals, but I wouldn't be shocked if it's Utah as well. I could see that. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised either. But um, Phoenix, I could see Phoenix getting there. I just don't know. I think Denver, Denver could end up causing some problems too. And, yeah, it's just, it's just the whole thing is weird. Scott O'Gallagher, I appreciate your time. Um, I know we'll continue to have these type of conversations. Absolutely. Where can people uh, find you? Any new upcoming information with yourself? The, the floor is yours. Social media, Instagram, Twitter. People are going to send you hate mail. Scott O'Gallagher on both. Um, IG I kind of keep. That's a private account, so I'm going to have to let you in that door, um, people. But, no, it's uh, Twitter is where you, where you can find me flapping my gums and having a bunch of bad takes. Um, so, yeah, no, that's where I'm at, man. Thanks for having me. This is a lot of fun. And, yeah, let's do it again. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. We'll talk soon. All right, brother.